In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Glory be to the Holy Trinity, our God, unto the ages of all ages, amen. Today I'd like to start, Haluni Abahat, absolve me, my fathers. Today I'd like to start with a, a small observation. Our Lord today in the readings did something very, very um, out of the ordinary. He did something that is very strange to us, at least. Something that he normally doesn't do, and that is he cursed the fig tree. But he didn't curse, meaning little kids don't think he's cursing, meaning bad words, no. Cursing here means to remove the blessing that he would give. It's the removal of the blessing. And we see this in today's first hour, Gospel and third hour gospel. The same gospel was read twice in the first hour and once in the third hour. It's all in from St. Mark chapter 11 and also found in St. Matthew chapter 21. What happened quickly? He was leaving Bethany and he was really, really hungry. And he saw a fig tree, it said, from afar. Usually when there's no leaves on trees right now, there's no really leaves, you can't really identify which tree is what. How would you identify it? By its what? Its leaves. So this tree had a lot of leaves. So it drew his attention. It drew the attention of our Savior. And so he went over there, but yet he found no... Uh, don't put anything up right now, please. Don't put anything up. When I say the, the verse, just black it out, please. So he went, he was looking for the, uh, the fruit. He went, he saw these big, huge leaves, and then he looked under this leaf, didn't find any fruit. He looked under another leaf, it didn't find any fruit. He looked under another, and then this is where he cursed it. He said, let no one ever eat fruit from you again. Very strange, very strange. Even though, even though we are told in the same gospel that it was not time for fruit. Don't you think the Lord knew that it wasn't time? Okay. He knew. He's the creator. He created the fig tree. He knows exactly the times and the seasons. We'll get back to that point in a minute. But God blesses, usually, and that's all that he does. He blesses. Blessing is mentioned countless times in the scripture. It begins with the creation. When God blessed the fish and the birds and the cattle and said, be fruitful, multiply. He blessed Adam and Eve, and he said, be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth, fill it. He blessed Abraham with the offspring as numerous as the stars of the, the, the heavens, the sand of the seashore, and the dust of the earth. He even blessed Noah when he came out of the ark. So God is accustomed to blessing. Now, when God's blessing is in a person's life or in a situation, we have, first of all, fruitfulness. Fruitfulness. He did this when he blessed the five loaves and the two fish, right? He blessed the five loaves and two fish, and he had enough food for just 5,000 men besides women and children. With God's blessing, there's also abundance. Abundance. When he said to the disciples, launch out into the deep for a catch. And St. Peter said, well, we've been working all night, but because of your word, we will. And they went out and they, they found the catch so big that the, the, the ships were what? They were sinking. Okay, there's abundance, there's fruitfulness. There's health. When God blesses, there's health. Hezekiah the king in the Old Testament was about to die. He, he was pronounced a judgment against him. And so he turned, it said, to his wall on his bed. He started praying. And then the word of the Lord came back to Isaiah and said, Go back to him and tell him that I have added on to your life. Anybody know how many? 
15 years, very good, 15 years. Abundance, fruitfulness, health. When God blesses, He gives also peace, salam. It said in the reign of Solomon the king, that his prophecy of his uh, kingship, that he was going to enjoy complete uh, peace. And he enjoyed it because of the blessing of God. So many more things. Victory for Joshua and all his battles, except maybe one. Prosperity with Elijah and the widow of Zarephath with the cruise of oil and the flower, the bin of flour. Protection when St. Paul in the book of Acts, um, they were making a fire and then the snake came out and latched onto his arm a poisonous viper and then he just shook it off went into the fire and the people there they first thought they said oh he must be an evil man he must be a criminal or a murderer for the gods okay they were pagan to have this snake bite him they were waiting for him to drop a few minutes you know how venom works right and then nothing happened then they, they said oh he must be a god they started worshiping him and he said, no, 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 I'm a man. And then he explained to them, protection, prosperity, victory, peace, health, abundance, fruitfulness. So the question remains, why did the Lord curse the tree, especially when it wasn't time for it to have fruit? Was the Lord justified to do so? And I'm here, I'm posing a rhetorical question because who are we to ask or question what the Almighty does? Like Jeremiah said, can the clay say to the potter, why have you made me so? So simply, you know the answer. He looked for something, he couldn't find it. He wanted something in return for all of his love, for all of his protection, for all of his kindness, for all of his patience, for all of his blessings. He deserves something back, a basically what we would say today, a return on our investment. God invests a lot in you. God invested a lot in Israel. God invested so much that he wants something back from you. He doesn't want too much. He just wants a little bit of fruit. And we're gonna talk about what types of fruit. And this idea of God's hunger for you and something from you is illustrated in Isaiah 5, 1 through 7. I'm gonna read that with you on the screen. Could you make the, the font a little bit bigger, please, so we can read it a little bit bigger? Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my well-beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted with and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected to bring it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. Here's the scary part now. Here's the judgment. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned, and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come upon briars and thorns, I will also command the clouds that they rain, no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. 
Think for a minute. You can take it off the screen now. Think for a minute with me. The vineyard of the Lord. The vineyard of the Lord in the Old Testament was the children of Israel. He called Israel, the children of Israel, his son. He called Israel his bride. Especially when they would go and worship pagan idols, he would say, you have prostituted yourself. You broke the covenant between me, the husband, and you, the wife, O Israel. Think about that as the Old Testament. The New Testament comes along, and the church becomes the new Israel. Therefore, the church becomes the new vine. The church becomes the new vineyard. And you find that just like God in the Old Testament required fruit from the Old Testament church, so also does he require fruit from the New Testament church, which is us. Think about, let's go back, think about someone like Adam and Eve. Not a care in the world. Enjoyed great abundance. Cherished God's fellowship in the garden. They were sustained by God's grace to the point that if they continued in obedience, the grace of God would render them from mortal to immortal. The grace of God. And God answered his own question when he said, what shall I do? And he even was humble enough to say, judge between me and my vineyard. Judge and tell me. And then he says, of course, I will take its hedge away. A hedge is what protects the vineyard. Then he says, I will burn it and break down its walls. There's not going to be any protection whatsoever. You and I are also a tree. We are a tree. Psalm 1 says that we are a tree planted by the waters, right, of the rivers. The wife, the wife is like a, a branch. The children, the psalm says, like olive plants round about a, your table. And the church, like I said, is the new Israel, the vine which he has planted. If you just look straight up at the dome and you see there's some writing around the Lord Jesus Christ. It's from Psalm 80, verse 14. And it says, if you can read it, I'll read it from, from here. Return, we beseech you, O God of hosts, look down from heaven and see, and visit this vine and the vineyard which your right hand has planted. He's not talking about the old Israel now. He's talking about the new Israel. He's talking about the new church, the new church of the, old, of the New Testament. And this new church, you, me, not the building, you are the vine, you are the vineyard, and you are asked to bring forth fruit, to be blessed by God, to be looked upon by God's merciful eyes. I think you'll agree with me that the same eyes that God looks at us with mercy, He also can look with judgment. Like he did, for example, to the unjust servant who was forgiven 10,000 denarii but wouldn't forgive his own fellow servant 100 denarii. So he looked at him first with the eyes of mercy. He let him go when he pleaded. But once he didn't let his own fellow servant go, the same eyes he looked with judgment. He did the same thing to the five foolish virgins who didn't come prepared. He did the same to those who refused to clothe, to offer drink, to shelter, to go visit the sick people in need in the parable in Matthew chapter 25. And he also did the same with the servant who buried his talent. He buried his talent and he was, a, he was banished into outer darkness. So tonight, I want to focus on the idea of fruit in your life and in my life. What good is it, my beloved, to have leaves 
big leaves, which attracted the attention of the Lord, if there's no accompanying fruit with it. So the Lord here, why it was put in the gospel, it said it was not the time for fruit. So then it's not really the fault of the tree, right? No. The tree, of course, is a tree. It, it doesn't feel, it can't sin. But like I said, it's a symbol of the human. Old Testament, Israel, New Testament, Israel. And he's saying here, what I'm cursing is the hypocrisy. Because the fig leaf is a big leaf. And it's the same leaf that Adam and Eve used to sew together to, to cover their own nakedness. And so the leaves here means this outward sign, this false sign of spiritual bankruptcy, or I'm sorry, this outward sign of beauty, of being full, of being spiritual, of being fruitful, but yet on the inside there's bankruptcy. And that's what the fathers and the Lord and the Bible call hypocrisy, displaying something on the outside that doesn't match on the inside. So, if we now know the reason for the curse, let's try to figure out how we can offer fruits to the Lord. First of all, he was hungry. What is he hungry for from you? Perhaps we can remember what St. John the Baptist said. He was speaking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he says, bear fruits worthy of... Hmm, anybody know? Repentance, okay? Bearing fruits worthy of repentance. Okay, so he was looking, he's hungry. First, the bottom line, the basic thing that you and I every day should do is offer fruits of repentance. Even St. Paul in Acts 26, he says the same thing, that we should do works of repentance. And what does that mean? The first thing is, is to acknowledge our sin. Nobody, nobody, nobody wants to say that they're wrong. Nobody wants to say that they've sinned. Nobody wants to admit their faults. And part of a proper prayer when you address the Lord in your personal prayers, after you finish your Igbeya and you have your personal prayer, one of the five things that the church taught us is that we should admit our sins and our weaknesses in front of the Lord. It's this, it's this broken heartedness, like David said, a broken and contrite heart. St. Paul says, I pour out myself broken as an offering to you. This brokenness, okay? Perhaps maybe a fruit of the repentance could be some tears, some repentance, some regret. Perhaps maybe an apology, an apology to the person I offended, perhaps. Maybe to offer reparations, to repair. So if I've stolen something, I stole $10 or I stole something, or I, I used a coupon that I wasn't supposed to illegally from Wawa or wherever, I should go back to Wawa and give them $10. Now, if you're worried about getting caught, then you take that same $10, whatever the value is that I stole, I take that and I put it into the church. Okay, that's the reparation. That's how we have to uh, help ourselves. Because when we sin, we sin against God, but we also sin against one another. So if I curse at you, I can go and I can confess to Abuna, but I also need to come and approach you and say, I'm sorry, so-and-so, I shouldn't have gossiped about you. I shouldn't, have, I shouldn't have spoke about you in that way. Another fruit of repentance could be taking steps not to fall again. A lot of times we go to confession, yes, we confess, we say the sin, but we don't have a practical plan how not to fall into the same sin. Perhaps that could be a fruit as well. 
Another fruit would be compassion on those who are weak. And then perhaps a commitment to a lively spiritual life. Another type of fruit that the Lord could be looking for are the fruits of the work of the Holy Spirit in us. The love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the faithfulness, the gentleness, the self-control. He's looking for these type of fruits. Also, in St. Peter, he says, this is a big one too. He says that the fruit of my faith is salvation. He says in 1 Peter 1, 9, receiving the end of your faith. What's the end of your faith? The result of your faith. The result of your faith is the salvation of your souls. That's another fruit. So you work on faith, but it's not just a faith like... Let me ask you a question. Do demons, the devils, are you with me? Devils, do they have faith? Yes or no? Yes. But is it the same faith that can move mountains? Is it the same faith that you have or I have? No. The faith that they have is it's a faith of just acknowledgement. They know God exists. They know He's powerful. They know He could do this and this and this. And even St. James in his epistle says in 2.19, you believe that there is one God. Okay, you do well. Even the demons believe. So he was speaking here about the relationship between faith and fruit, or what he called faith and works. Faith and works. So the dead faith is what the demons have. The dead faith is the faith that, yeah, they acknowledge God exists. Everybody in the world practically can agree and say, there was a man whose name was Christ Jesus and he lived on the earth. That doesn't mean they have faith, right? But we, when we say we have faith, we mean we have faith in the sense that we trust the type of faith that we have is the type in which we trust God. And when we trust, we submit. When we trust and submit, we obey. Sometimes I think we may have faith, more faith in the chef at a restaurant that we go to. In the sense that when you go to that restaurant, you know he's not gonna poison your food, right? We don't even, maybe we don't even have that type of faith when it comes to the Lord. When you go to an elevator and you press the up button, you know you're going to go up, right? That's that faith. But do we have that same faith with the Lord? The fruit of faith is so important for us. It's this idea of trusting. Just like every time you get on an airplane, you trust that this pilot is trained, He's not on any sort of substances and he's going to get you from point A to point B in a safe way, correct? So, this trust, this faith, what does this faith should look like? What did the faith should look like? First, it's picking up our cross. If you have faith, the correct type of faith, you pick up your cross. You don't take the cross and throw it in the garbage and say, I don't want this. I want a smaller one. Or I don't want a cross at all. The trust in God means to deny our own will. The trust in God means to deny our own will and try to fulfill His will. The trust in God means the acts of mercy, even when I'm needy. Remember the woman who had two coins left? The two, the two coins with the widow, she had no other money. She had nothing else. She opened up her little tete bag, she pulled out the two coins, and she threw it in without any second thought. That's the type of faith, the idea of trust, the acts of mercy, the giving. And then, of course, the trust that allows me to repent. Okay? Question. 
We all like lib, right? I don't know how to, as is lib, so I, I have no idea, and so I don't eat it, but you take one of those, okay? Maybe a, a sunflower seed, a uh, watermelon seed. You take it and put it in your pocket, right? Just one. And you forget it. Ten years later, you get your faragaya out. I mean, you get your uh, gelabaya. I mean, uh, your pants out. Sorry. <laughs> you get your 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 clothing out, and you look at what what's going to happen to that seed in your pocket if if it's there and nobody touched it ten years from now. What's going to happen to it? Nothing. It's going to be there. It's going to be dead. It has a potential to live, right? It has a potential to live. But it's dead. It's absolutely, it means absolutely nothing. It's fruitless without putting it in the right environment and then having it grow and then having some sort of fruit. So, the message for tonight is very simple. Everyone look at your life right now to yourself. Think about what type of fruit have you offered to the Lord this year? Forget about the year. During the great and holy Lent, the, the great and holy fast. What fruit? Same, same as before? We did just what? Change a diet? We still yell at our husbands. We still yell at our wives. We still disobey our parents. We beat up our siblings. We watch bad stuff. We still curse. What fruit? Imagine if the Lord Jesus Christ comes to your house today, right now. You're going home in peace, and you open the door, and you find the Lord. And he says, um, I'm hungry, I need some fruit. I don't like really uh, any meat or chicken, I just want some fruit. And you have what, in your fridge maybe? Oranges that are six months old, right? Carrots that have this green stuff on them, <laughs> right? Uh, pears that are as soft as a marshmallow, right? Apples that look like prunes. Are you going to take those and give them to the Lord? No. But that's what we do. That's what we do. We have to offer the best fruit ever to Him. Because there is going to come a time, he's going to say, he's going to be looking, I'm hungry. He's going to knock on your door and mine, and he's going to say, I want fruit. I've given you 60, 70, 100 years on earth. Give me some fruit now. What did you do with all the money I gave you? Did you give to the needy? What did you do with your health? What did you do with your mind? What did you do with your eyes? Did you read my book? What did you do? We have to hurry. There's, this, there's a sense of urgency. We have to feel very like rushed. We need to offer fruit. How? Practical advice, first thing to do. First thing to do, avoid sin. Avoid sin, no matter how big or how small it is, because sin robs you of your fruit. Greed, the sin of greed, avarice, the love of money, robs you of charity to those who are needy. The, the, the sin of sexual immorality robs you of your purity without which no one can see the Lord, we are told. The sin of hatred and jealousy robs you of brotherly love. The sin of laziness robs us of our opportunities to serve and use our time to serve others. The sin of gluttony, the love of food, robs us of self-control and the sins of addiction to alcohol, nicotine, marijuana, or any sort of drugs robs you of your freedom. Don't you know that? It takes away your freedom. So the first thing in order to, it takes away the fruit 
which is freedom, the fruit of purity, the fruit of donation, the fruit of brotherly love, the fruit of service, the fruit of self-control. So the first thing we need to do is to avoid sin. Don't make sin your friend. Make sin your enemy. Put it on a level where you will never, ever do that sin. Some way, somehow, figure it in your mind that this sin is something that is way, way out of reach. Second thing, practically, obtain godly wisdom. Wisdom. Today's readings are all scattered throughout the whole day, from the morning, mostly in the morning. Wisdom, 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 wisdom. It's always talking about wisdom. But it's not the wisdom of the world. It's not the book smart wisdom. It's not the wisdom of Einstein, or Einstein, depending on how you say it. It's the godly wisdom. It's the wisdom that comes from the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What in the world is the fear of the Lord? I'm going to walk out, he's going to throw a lightning bolt and fry me. That's not the healthy fear of God. No, absolutely. And if we have that, we shouldn't. We don't fear God in that way. What we fear, according to the scriptures, first is to acknowledge His might and power, His position. The Lord said to us in the Gospel, Don't fear them who after they have killed have no power over you. Fear Him who after He has killed has power to throw into everlasting fire. So it's this respect for who He is and His power in my life. That's where it all starts. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you have that type of understanding of God, you're going to start your first few baby steps onto wisdom. The wisdom of God. Not the wisdom of the world. Wisdom also means to be able to discern Make, like make the difference or tell the difference between what is good and what is evil. It says today in, in the, the reading of uh, Son of Sarah, Woe to those who call good evil and evil a good. Woe to those who call sweet things bitter and bitter sweet. Woe to those who call light darkness and darkness light. So when we seek the wisdom, wisdom has a lot to do with truth. God created one man and one woman. There are only two genders. Don't believe the lies they're telling you in your school. They're trying to brainwash you, especially in your colleges. It's a miracle that when you get through college, you're still a believer in Christ. They're not institutions of education anymore. Unfortunately, they're institutions of indoctrination. Stick to the truth. You want to be wise? First, acknowledge who He is and His power. That's how you fear God. And that's how you get wisdom. Second, be truthful. What is good, you say is good. What is bad, you say is bad. What is light is light. What is dark is dark. What is sweet is sweet. What is bitter is bitter. Third, to be wise, we must accept instruction. In today's reading, Isaiah, and in Proverbs, My son, hear the instruction of your father, and do not forsake the law of your mother. Be open to instruction. No matter how old you are, no matter how young you are, you always have to take advice from your two spiritual parents and your two physical parents. Our Father in Heaven and our Church, the Mother. That's our uh, spiritual parents. And then our physical parents here on Earth. 
Another thing, how to acquire wisdom or the fear of God, is to keep the commandments simply. Which means simply, choose Christ. Choose His way. Choose His will. Choose His path. This is simple. It's just that way. Choose His way. Choose Christ. Choose His path. Choose His will. That's all that it means when He says, keep my commandments. Choose something that I would want for you. Choose something that I would do. Imitate me, St. Paul says, as I imitate Christ. Fifth and final, ask for wisdom. You don't have wisdom because it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom. You don't have wisdom? He says, ask for it. James chapter 1 verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally. Liberally means openly, abundantly. And without reproach, without blame, without counting. I gave you two dollars, I'm not going to lend you another dollar. God doesn't do that. He gives liberally. He gives abundantly, without reproach. And if you ask, he says, it will be given to you. It will be given to you. Result? What's the result of all this? You're going to have fruit. The result, like we read in Joshua, son of Sirach, in chapter 1 today, you will have a happy end. You will, he, it also says in the same reading, you will be drenched, inebriated with God's, I'm sorry, with wisdom's fruits. Didn't we just say the Lord was hungry for fruit? So if you pursue wisdom, if you pursue the wisdom, you will have plenty from God. Just ask God. Instead of a curse, my beloved, we will receive that blessing. So I hope and I pray that after we heard the words of the Lord, the very harsh words, and if we're not going to be able to, to, to be courageous and bold enough to, to look at these difficult words during Holy Week, we're never going to be able to look at these words. There's a time for us okay, to speak about God's love. Absolutely. Our God is a God of love. But He's not all about love. There's a balance. okay? Because the same God who is the God of love and identified as the God of love, also is the one who didn't let the five foolish virgins in, who condemned the servant who dug and left his talent. He didn't say, Malish, it's okay. You were late, you don't have oil, it's fatalu. Or the guy that didn't have the garment. No, 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 it's okay. You're only one person. There's plenty of room in the kingdom. Yalla. No, no. You have to have a balance in these things. But even if, let's say I'm a person right now, I have no fruit. I'm thinking, I just heard this word and I'm thinking, I have absolutely no fruit in my life. Is that it for me? No, no. Because the Lord in His mercy, in Luke chapter 13, He gives us a parable also of a barren fig tree. But you know what? In this parable, it's a little bit different. And this is how I'm going to end our talk tonight. Luke 13, 6, 9. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree. There it goes again, the fig tree. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came seeking fruit on it and found none, zero. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I haven't found any. Cut it down. Why does it use up my ground? 
He could plant other things that could be fruitful. Why should he have a tree there for three years who's not getting him any fruit for himself to eat or to be sold to make money for him? Cut it down. It's taking up room. Just like I could be taking up room in the church for somebody else who really wants the Lord. But look what he says here. But he answered and said to him, Sir, as if he's begging him, Sir, let it alone. Leave it alone just this year also. So how many years has it been? Three years. So he's asking for a, a fourth year. Until, Lord, let me dig around it. Let me fertilize it. Maybe he'll water it. And if it bears fruit, well, good. But if not, then after it, you can cut it down. My beloved, God is looking for fruit. What is your fruit? What is my fruit? If I have nothing to offer to him, the fruit of his love was his life for you. In exchange for your, for your death, he took the death. So if there's nothing that I have to offer him as fruit right now, let's start. Because our guardian angel, the Virgin Mary, the saints are saying, Lord, Lord, no, no, no. Let it alone this year again. One more, just one more year for this person. He'll come around, she'll come around. Just one more year. And I'll dig around it, and I'll water it, and I'll fertilize it. I promise. And then revisit it next time. So every day of yours, of your life and mine, is another year, another chance for fruit. So if you don't have any fruit the whole entire life, don't worry. Walihimmak. Doesn't matter. But start today. Start right now. When Abuna gives us the final blessing and the litanies, we should be praying all of these things. Let's give a, a fruit, for example, of, of our doxology, of our praise. When you pray and sing, the fruit of repentance, the fruit of love, the fruit of giving, the fruit of tender-heartedness, St. Paul says. The fruit of being patient with, with my husband, with my wife. The fruit of obedience for you young people to obey your parents. Let's find the fruit of purity, the fruit of truth, some fruit, find any fruit. How many fruits did you, do you think it would have taken the Lord if he went to that fig tree? How many fruits would it have been enough to satisfy him? A whole, like, basket? A few, one, not really, I mean, one, figs are, you know, I could eat like 20 figs in one setting. I'm sure you can too, <laughs> or maybe not, but 10, five. So some fruit, he's not asking for a lot. He's just asking for some fruit. Give him something, give him something. My beloved, let's make the heart of our Lord joyful. When he comes to us, let our trees be filled with the fruit, the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of holiness, the fruit of justice, the fruit of love. And glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.